on his computer. All set. Okay. Hi, everybody. So my name is Carol Stern. I'm a librarian at the Glen Cove Public Library, and I know many of you know me. Um, before we even start the whole program, I just want to tell you that our friends of the library are looking for new members and membership. They help support programs like the one today. So if you're interested in becoming a friend of the library, we would gladly welcome it. Um, Amy put a link in the chat um, that you can uh, apply online or call me. There's a phone number in the chat room. And if you're interested, we would be glad to have you. Um, I also want to just tell you to mark your calendars for the next author talk. Next month is Long Island Reads Month, and the book is The Living and the Lost. Um, if you go on our website, you'll see the details. We're having a North Shore Reads and a Long Island Reads, um, so you can get all that information on our webpage. Um, and on Tuesday, May 17th at 2 o'clock, we're hosting Jessica Anna Blau, and she's the author of Mary Jane, another very good book. Now I'd like to welcome Jennifer. It's a great pleasure to have you here with us today, especially because March is Women's History Month. It's a celebration of vital contributions by women in American history and society. Jennifer is the New York Times bestselling author of several acclaimed historical novels and the beloved Elm Creek Quilt series. She's a graduate of the University of Notre Dame and the University of Chicago. She lives with her husband and two sons in Madison, Wisconsin. If I'm correct, I think you've written 42 novels. Is that correct? Uh, I think it's, it's 32 novels. Oh, yeah. And then I have other works of nonfiction as well. So I counted wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I could be counting wrong. I mean, once you get to a certain point, you just stop counting. It's like your age, you know, you just... <laughs> well, it's remarkable. So this book is particularly uh, special to me because my cousin's grandmother, my grandmother's sister, met Alice Paul at a reception in Geneva, I believe in the 30s. Alice Paul invited my family to move into a villa with a few other refugee families in Geneva where the World's Women's Party had its headquarters. Mm -hmm. My grandmother's sister did translation for Alice Paul. Alice Paul then helped with the family's application to come to the United States. My grandmother's family kept in touch with Alice throughout her whole life. So when my cousin told me that this book was about Alice Paul, I, I just couldn't wait to get my hands and read this book. And I was not disappointed. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat box and we'll try to get them all, uh, to all of them at the end of the um, event. We're gonna mute everyone during the discussion and again, there'll be questions and answers after. As a lover of historical fiction, it's my favorite genre, The Women's March was a total pleasure to read. So this book is full of incredible historical details about the women's suffrage movement. So what inspired you to write about the 1913 suffrage procession? And do you remember the first time you learned about the suffrage procession? Well, I've for a long time, I've wanted to write a novel about the women's suffrage movement here in the US. But as I was saying with Antonia earlier, it, you know, it covered generations and there were so many people involved with so many significant events. I wasn't quite sure how to, you know, where to come into it, what angle to take. Um, so I, I kind of had that on the back burner while I was working on other books. But then in January of 2017, soon after um, well, the idea to the, for the book came, came to me, after the Women's March on Washington, the day after the inauguration of the 45th president, there were nearly half a million demonstrators in the US Capitol. And then there were millions of other protesters in satellite or, and marchers and demonstrators in satellite marches around the world, including an estimated 100,000 here in my hometown of Madison, Wisconsin. So afterwards, when I was reading news coverage of the 2017 march, I was intrigued to learn that the Women's March of 2017 had a very important but nearly forgotten historical precedent. And I believe it was an article in the Smithsonian Magazine. And they said, well, did you know? And my response is, I did not. And I wanted to learn more. 
And it was fascinated me reading this in 2017 that more than a hundred years earlier, thousands of women had assembled in the nation's capital the day before the inauguration of President Woodrow Wilson to demonstrate on behalf of women's suffrage. And this march had been months in the planning. The organizers of, of which Alice Paul was, was the lead, they had planned this beautiful dignified parade that would go from the Capitol building down Pennsylvania Avenue past the White House. They wanted elegantly costumed marchers and bands, equestrians and then automobiles conveying dignitaries along and then all kinds of lavish floats depicting important events in the history of the suffrage movement. And um, sometimes women also marched grouped according to their profession or there were state delegations too. And everything was just supposed to demonstrate how women were already very making very important uh, contributions to the economy and to the culture of the United States. And with all of these contribu contributions, surely they deserved a say in who represented them in Washington as well. And one of the most important aspects of the suffrage procession was to reemphasize or to emphasize a renewed focus on passing an amendment to the Constitution, granting women the right to vote wherever they lived in the United States. Because up until this point, the suffrage movement had focused on a state by state approach. And so if you could convince the men in your state to vote for it, well, then the women in that state had suffrage. And uh, so it was this patchwork of where women could vote and where they couldn't. And Alice Paul and Lucy Burns and, and their, the rest of the people on the, in their organization they realized, or their, their smaller you know, committee as a part of the larger group, they realized that there were certain states in the US that were never going to give women the right to, to vote if it was done in a state by state approach. So Alice Paul wanted that amendment so that it didn't matter where you happen to be born or where you happen to live, you would be able to vote. So, you know, it, it <laughs> The beautiful march that they had planned, if you've read the story, I don't wanna have spoilers if you haven't, but it didn't go off as Alice Paul had planned. Um, there were interlopers who made sure that it wasn't the beautiful event she had envisioned, but they persisted and they made it through the march and then um, they had an important impact on the suffrage movement moving forward. And then as I was reading more about this, I discovered some very striking parallels between the women's suffrage procession of 1913 and the 2017 Women's March on Washington. In both centuries, the organizers faced daunting logistical obstacles as they brought their plans to fruition. Participants were subjected, subjected to ridicule and harassment and even physical harm in both of those marches. There were, during the planning stages, disagreements between factions of the various women's movements of both eras because they had competing interests. And then there were heated controversies, both then and in the 21st century, about the exclusion or the marginalization of women of color. But of course, the differences between the two marches due to the culture and social changes that had happened over that century I found equally compelling as well. So my imagination was just absolutely captivated. And I decided that I wanted to learn more about the historical event and then share what I learned with my readers in the form of, of a historical novel in the form of fiction. Interesting. On the copyright page, you, you said this is a work of fiction. And then you wrote the names, characters, places, and incidents are products of the author's imagination and are used fictitiously and are not to be considered as real. Any resemblance to actual events, locales, organizations, or persons living or dead is entirely coincidental. Why did you say this on the copyright page? The, the main well, let characters me, let me are stop you there. Well, let me stop okay. you right there. The copyright page is standard boilerplate text provided by the publisher. So I did not write anything oh. on the 
on the copyright page. That is, you'll that's standard boilerplate disclaimer that you'll see in historical novels that are published in the United States. So I I could not tell you why it is worded that way. Um, it's it wasn't anything that I had anything to do with. So then the the, the book I think is historically accurate. It, it, that that's correct. Well, I do my research. I I. I love the historical research process. To me, it's like doing, um, it's like detective work, historical detective work, and I really enjoy it. I am a total library geek. And oh, and I imagine, I'm, I forgot, I'm speaking to people at a library. I'm sure you can identify with that, with that attitude. Um, so I love doing the research. Now, when you are writing historical fiction, you are allowed to and expected to invent stuff. And some authors like to have every single historical detail as absolutely correct as, you know, as they can get it, you know, having not actually been a witness. And then see, some people like to take a historical setting and then maybe a historical event and then just make up everything else from the characters to events and all of that. Really, historical fiction is legitimately allowed to fall anywhere on the spectrum. So I know that readers, my readers have told me at least that they like to think that they are learning accurate things from my books. Um, so I do try to follow the historical record as much as I can um, without bogging down the story because I am a storyteller. Without bogging down the story I'm trying to tell in too many extraneous details. I will sacrifice historical accuracy for the sake of the narrative. Like if someone made 27 trips back and forth between two towns, I might just say they did it twice, you know, just to pare it down a bit because I don't wanna overburden the reader with details that don't fit in the flow of the story. I won't do something, for example, like, oh, you know, it would be really convenient if the Women's March had taken place in June. I wouldn't just say, okay, well, I'm gonna put it in June. Now you are allowed to do that if you're writing historical fiction. And I don't fault any other author who takes that approach. It's just not the way that I like to work. So I do try to be as historically accurate as possible without making it a burdensome for my readers and a drag for me to write and just not fun as a story. Now that said, something to keep in mind is that there are simply some things that never end up in the historical record. Private conversation, innermost thoughts, often just the weather on a particular day, what kind of food somebody likes, what they might see or smell as they are walking down a street. So anytime you see those kind of details, you really should assume that your historical novelist has just made them up. And then another thing to keep in mind too is that sometimes the historical record is wrong. And we've all done this, you know, maybe we said something happened on a Thursday, maybe we write it in our diary that way. I remember a month ago, and then it turns out, oh, wait a minute, it was actually two months ago. So sometimes there are errors in the historical record and, you know, novelists have to try to figure out, well, this source it happened, says it happened here with these people. And this source says it happened the, with these people a whole year earlier. And then the historical novelist has to decide, okay, what seems more plausible, what works better in my story, and then you try to reconcile the two. Now, if you were writing nonfiction, you could say something like, oh, sources differ on when this happened, but you can't do that in a novel. You gotta pick one storyline and go with it. So, um, you know, you really, anywhere on that spectrum, you can, you can really, um, you know, you're allowed to as a historical novel, stay as true as you can, or just take all kinds of liberties because it's fun. I mean, you know, the, um, the wonderful novel, The Underground Railroad that came out recently uh, within the past few years. I mean, it had an actual literal underground railroad, a railroad underground, and the book was brilliant. I loved it, I recommend it, very critically acclaimed. And I'm not gonna say, oh, well, but there wasn't really a railroad and just write it off. I think that would be, you know, you'd be doing a disservice to the book and you'd also be really limiting yourself as a reader as to what kind of things you're going to enjoy. So really anywhere on the spectrum, you can actually, you can go with that. 
as I said before, it's my favorite genre. I, I love it. So the three uh, women in the story, the center uh, of the story, Alice, uh, Maud, and Ida. How did you How did you get them? Uh, all the insight. How did you do your research to show all the insight of these people? You know, how did you come up with these three people to write about? How did you do that? Right. I think I think the choice of the narrators um, was absolutely essential to this story. But really, it is in all of my historical fiction. You know, whose perspective will my readers see these historical events? Because I'm not just telling you what happened. You know, that's not what I'm trying to do. I would write biography or I would write history. What I'm trying to share with my readers is what it felt like, what it, see, what it felt like to be that person in that moment of history. So everything that you read in my historical fiction is filtered through that character's perspective. I'm not just laying out facts for you. I'm showing you what it would have been like, or I'm trying in any way to show you what it would have been like to be there at that moment through that person's eyes. So, you know, the, everything, the entire rest of the novel would absolutely depend upon what voices I choose to emphasize. So I really, while I was doing my research, because I had started my historical research before I decided on my narrators, but as I was doing the research, I really recognized early on that it would be very important to explore the intersection of sex, class, and race that had so profoundly affected the suffrage movement in the United States. And I also knew that my narrators, which I, whom I plan to choose from among the many remarkable women who were involved in suffrage campaigns at the time, because there were so many I could have chosen. I wanted them to be strong, independent, courageous women who played a significant role in the procession. So of course, my first choice was Alice Paul. She was the director of the march and a prominent suffragist. So her perspective was absolutely essential to the story. The second to join my cast of characters was Ida B. Wells Barnett, the renowned civil rights activist, journalist, and co-founder of the NAACP, among so many other uh, achievements to her credit. Uh, she adamantly insisted that the suffrage procession and the proposed constitutional amendment that it was promoting must include women of color. It was perfectly reasonable for her to believe that black women and other people of color, other women of color might just kind of be shoved to the side and their interests not taken into consideration when the laws were written. It was a perfectly reasonable concern for her to have. So my third narrator, and my Alice, Alice, I'd be Wells Barnett and Alice Paul are very well known and they're, they're studied in schools and their works are still in print and all of that. But my third narrator has been almost completely forgotten. You can, if you look for her, you'll find her in the historical record, but most people haven't heard of her anymore, which is amazing because she was absolutely notorious in her time. Well, you will like this, everyone from Glen Clove. She was a native New Yorker and her name is Maud Malone. She was a daughter of Irish immigrants and she was an outspoken advocate for women's rights and workers' rights. So she really was on the ground working with um, the poor, the working class, immigrants, trying to make sure that they were represented when they couldn't vote and rep seek representation themselves. So one of the things that um, I loved about Maud Malone. And one of the reasons why I wanted to include her was because, um, well, she was well known for organizing these outdoor suffrage rallies in New York City, sometimes in New York City, sometimes she, a lot of times she'd go up to Albany and she would just be there with her banner, you know, her sash and her signs. And she would just march around the state capitol all by herself, marching for suffrage. And you know she endured a certain amount of ridicule, but she gave as good as she got. And um, some sometimes though this got her it got her some criticism from the press. And in one article in a New York City uh, newspaper, they referred to her as a militant suffragette librarian. And as soon as I heard that, I thought, oh, I don't know her, but I love her already. So I mean, anyone who's called 
a militant suffragette librarian, how can you not include them in your book? I mean, I, I found myself powerless to resist, including Maud Malone in the novel. So I just loved, I mean, I love libraries. My first job as a high school student, you know, my first real job other than babysitting was working in a library. So I thought, okay, I would love this woman in real life. So she's got to be one of my narrators. So that was how I, that was how I decided which voices to emphasize and which perspectives to introduce to my readers in the novel. And you will see that throughout the book though, there are other important figures from the suffrage movement that appear here and there. And I really tried to capture them, you know, the, their personalities and what they were most focused on with the suffrage movement. Um, but really, I mean, I I, I'm very happy with my choice of narrators, but you know, if this were a three volume, you know, trilogy, a series rather than a single book, there would have been so many, so many voices I could have included. And I think that's a real testament to the suffrage movement itself that, you know, we focus on, you know, Susan B. Anthony or Ida B. Wells, but really this was the suffrage movement spanned generations. And there were thousands of women whose names we no longer remember who were involved in this, whether it was working to get a state suffrage movement passed in their own in, in their own community or whether they marched on that march day or you know however they contributed they all played a role even when we don't remember them these countless numbers of women who who are now anonymous to us but really this victory of finally getting that amendment passed it really belongs to all of them and i really hope that the novel shows that, at least in some small way. Oh, I think it definitely does. Did, did they have, did like Ida have a relationship with Alice Paul? Was there any relationship between them? Did they? I have not found any evidence that they had met. Um, you know, Ida was based at that time in Chicago and Ida was um, or, I'm sorry, Ida was in Chicago at that time. That was her center. And then Alice was more on the East Coast. Um, if they if their paths crossed before the march, uh, I I wasn't aware of it. Um, but what I that wasn't so important to me that they met each other earlier. One of the things I hoped would the the structure of the book would show is that people can be working separately in different parts of this country, but they're all working towards the same goal. They don't necessarily have to be together in a room, which is actually an important lesson for us during this pandemic um, to be working together and achieving something, even if they're not directly connected. So, you know, striving for or that same goal, even if they're not necessarily as close as, say, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns were working, working right next to each other. And then, of course, they all converge for this very important event. So was there one character that was particularly more difficult to write about than the others, or it was just well, just doing research? They were all they were all great to write about. Um, I enjoyed writing about each of their from each of their perspectives. The most most difficult character to research, however, was Maud Malone, just because she ne no one ever wrote a biography of her, to my knowledge. She didn't leave behind a memoir. Um, she's not taught in high schools, but I'm very fortunate that um, she showed up in the New York papers and others, but mostly in the New York State and New York City papers, because one of her favorite things to do to, to you know, promote the suffrage movement was to write letters of editor, letters to the editor for all of these newspapers. So if you go to an online archive of um, newspapers, and enter her name, you'll see all these things she wrote to the editor of the New York Times or the editor of this paper or that paper. So, and that was really great because I got to see Maud Malone's thoughts in her own words. And, uh, you know, so maybe some of the stuff written about her was a little patronizing or a little annoyingly critical or condescending. But when you hear Maud's voice, she's confident and proud and clever 
and witty and charming. And so it's just wonderful to be able to see that, that voice. But um, other places where I would work to find information, not only about Maud, but about the other characters, um, I, I get a lot of great information from genealogy websites like ancestry.com. You know, you can find in the census records where someone was, was living, with whom they were living. And then, you know, you can figure out, okay, well, what would that neighborhood have been like? What would their life have been like? So um, with those kind of online resources, because it's a little tricky to travel. I didn't, I didn't travel to do any research during the pandemic, um, but I was able to glean all of this from some fantastic online resources. Now, fortunately, I didn't travel, but I had visited those cities before. I used to live in Chicago, so I was able to draw upon that past experience since traveling to do my research was just not an option for this book, unfortunately. Wow, that, that made it more difficult to write that you couldn't go to these places. It did, but you know what? That was hardly the most difficult thing about the pandemic. So, you know, it's just one, one, more, one more thing to, to adapt and, and work around, but uh, you know. So in the book, it said that um, Alice was fighting for suffrage in Great Britain. Um, yes. Yes. In you said that she faced imprisonment and hunger strikes. Um, Four scenes. How did you come up with the date March 1913? How did Alice come up with that to pick that date for the, the uh, March? Well, it was very important to her to, you know, one, I mean, she went, she was working with the Pankhurst and she's very involved in that. Um, what they, what the word they would use was militant. That was what critics would say. They, they did a lot of things that Americans would just, just thought were, oh, that's so inappropriate. You know, is British, they, they would smash windows. They set post office, post um, boxes on fire. I mean, they, they were pretty destructive and Americans that was just more than Americans were willing to accept. But when, when, so, um, Alice was over there working with them, but, you know, being arrested and going through hunger strikes and then being force fed, and as you can understand, took their toll on her health. So she had eventually returned to the U.S. only to find that the suffrage movement had practically stagnated here in the U.S. Um, because of all of these state measures were just stalling. You know, they would try something and, and the process for each state, some of them were so involved and so convoluted that it was, it seemed like it was almost impossible to get anything done. So she wanted to recover her health. She wanted to return to graduate school, but then she very quickly got drawn back into the suffrage movement. And it was as she was becoming more aware of what was going on in her own home country, when she, that was when she concluded with Lucy Burns that a national constitutional amendment is the only way we're gonna get this taken care of for all women. So she picked the, um, she picked the date of March 3rd um, precisely because it was the day before the inauguration of, of president-elect Woodrow Wilson. She knew that there would be lots of crowds in Washington on that day because they were arriving for all the inaugural festivities the following day. And she knew that the eyes of the press would be on Washington, DC. So she would. this would be a great opportunity to have a lot of exposure to the suffrage movement and especially this renewed focus on a constitutional amendment. But another thing was very important. Woodrow Wilson had been a little cagey about where he stood on the suffrage question during the campaign. And that was something that drove Maud Malone, just, you know, really annoyed her. She had this practice where she would go to campaign events and she would just stand up in the middle of them and ask the candidate, whoever it happened to be, what his position was, because it was always a he, what his position was on suffrage. And some of them, like Teddy Roosevelt, answer the question and she would sit down and they would all move on. But some of them like Woodrow Wilson didn't really want to be too specific, you know, didn't want to have to say one thing, wanted to play both sides, you know, would pass it off and saying, oh, you know, that's really an issue for states. I don't want to talk about that. 
So, you know, I think that you, you'd think that voters would want to know where a candidate stands on such an important issue. So one of the reasons for choosing that day was to put the incoming president on notice that regardless of how, whether he liked it or not, he was going to have to make woman's suffrage an important part of his administration. He could not ignore the subject because the suffragists were there and they would be watching him and they would be speaking out. So it was just a little bit of putting him on notice that this they were just not going to be good girls and go home and just wait patiently until the time was right to maybe let them vote. No, they were going to be there fighting for it. And he was going to have to pay attention. He was going to have to take action. So did they go state to state to the states that didn't allow, you know, people, women to vote? Did these women go to these states and actually go work on the movements there? Well, there were there were active campaigns in the individual states. And but, I mean, again, there were thousands and thousands of people working on this and men too. We talked about that before we, we um, before the program began. There were there were men involved in this as well. So usually, you know, there was enough to do with, with one program, with one approach or the other. And so you, you know, sometimes people would work on both, but usually the state campaigns were were composed of people from that state. It wasn't people from Washington going into the state and creating it. It was people, women within Illinois, for example, would be advocating their, the leaders in their state capital and, and advocating for them and demonstrating for them and speaking to other leaders to try to get their influence involved in it. So it was more of a state by state approach, not something that was organized, you know, but although there was, there was too an overarching organization, more than one that helped share information, share resources, share fundraising, but those different campaigns typically came from within the states themselves. But again, as I said at the outset, the problem with this was there were some states that were never going to give women the vote. And these were largely the same states that voted against the amendment when it finally came time to ratify it. Now, there are a lot of states out West that saw how much there was to be gained by having women participate in the political process. So it was a lot of Western states uh, that already had the vote. Um, Ida B. Wells Barnett's Illinois did not yet have it, but she was working on that campaign. And Maude Malone was very involved in the New York State campaign. But, you know, that's where Alice Paul and Lucy Burns came in saying, you know, we, we've got to think about the women in Mississippi too. It's not fair that just because they're born there and they live there that the rest of us will get the vote and they won't. We need it to be everyone, not just the fortunate ones who live in places where the measure passed. So interesting. Can you talk about the march from New York City to Washington? Um, do you know how many women actually marched in that? You know, I did when I wrote the book, but that number has kind of slipped my mind at, at this point. Um, but it was, it was, you know, it fluctuated. They started out with a core group of marchers. And then as they would pass through towns, they would gather some people who might travel them with a little, a little ways, or maybe all the way to the end. And then people had to drop out due to injuries, you know, their, their feet just couldn't take it anymore. But this was a, a really, uh, fascinating aspect of the suffrage movement. And it was led by someone named Rosalie Jones. Her followers called her General Jones. And one of the things that she liked to do to raise awareness, I already told you how Maude liked to just march around the state capital in Al Albany. Rosalie Jones liked to organize long distance marches, cross country march marches. And it was a way that, and we do this, you see this in various forms even today, these cross country trips or these long journeys to raise awareness for, you know, um, you know, like a particular, to raise money for a cancer charity or, you know, to, there's all kinds of reasons why we do these long, or people will sign up for a marathon to raise awareness for something, you know. So this is something that we still do. And, and Rosalie 
was involved in drawing attention to the suffrage movement through the spectacle of a group of women marching long distance. And she certainly did get, get attention. And they would use the opportunity to pass through a town and distribute suffrage literature and to give speeches and to try to influence people who maybe didn't know anything about their cause or maybe were ambivalent or had a negative impression to, you know, to, to humanize it and show, you know, this is really what we're about and to win over supporters. So, um, you know, she thought, oh, when she heard about Alice Paul's March, she thought, what a great way to promote the cause by marching from Manhattan all the way to Washington DC and then joining up with, with this, uh, with this, with the woman's suffrage procession, you know, on, in March, on March 3rd. So um, that was quite an ordeal. It was well covered in the newspapers and, you know, they, I mean, this was, you know, you know what it's like, Mar I mean, imagine marching from, you know, from Manhattan to DC and remember, this is February and March. I mean, you know, you'd, you'd probably need, you know, sled dogs to try to attempt something like that in, you know, where I live. Um, you could get a blizzard, you, you know, we get a polar vortex. And, you know, they had to in, endure marching in snow, marching in ice, marching in mud, you know, marching on well-paved streets and muddy, muddy country roads. And uh, so they certainly did get a lot of press attention. And, um, you know, Alice Paul wasn't really thrilled with this display because again, she wanted something very dignified and elegant. And, you know, a bunch of woman, women in brown cloaks marching through the mud didn't really fit into that. But, you know, this is part of what I said earlier about how there were different competing factions with different interests, um, you know, and different priorities, all wanting suffrage, of course, but you know, disagreeing on maybe the best approach to achieve those goals. I, I don't know if I read it in your book or you said it on another talk, but you also stated that Rosalie Gardner, she was a debutante, she was very privileged. That, that, that's really unbelievable that she did that, that she gave yes. up her, her privilege to fight for a cause, you know. You Absolutely. I mean, it is, yeah. it's, it's astonishing. Oh yes, she was a debutante, she had wealthy family. You know, she loved a gorgeous evening gown, you know, not for marching of course, but she had all this wealth and privilege. And, you know, she could have just enjoyed that, but she couldn't, she, she, it just wasn't in her to, you know, revel in her wealth and privilege when other people were suffering. And also, you know, she wanted a voice, she wanted a say. And, you know, she was educated. She thought she was pretty smart and I would agree. Why shouldn't she have a voice? Just because of, just because she was a woman, that just was nonsensical to her. So she had her point of view. Now her mother, on the other hand, was a literally card carrying member of a anti woman suffrage organization. So you can imagine the family dinners at that household. Yeah. If the mother absolutely insisting that women should not have the right to vote and the daughter saying, of course we should have the right to vote. And so th that's something that I found particularly just, it, I just had to shake my head. It was so unbelievable and you know, in many ways disappointing that there was a, a very active organization of women dead set against women getting the right to vote because you know these were usually privileged white women who were benefiting from the status quo and did not want to see things change and their attitude was why should we need the right to vote our men look out for us we trust our husbands and our sons and our brothers and fathers to look out for our interests, why should we need to get involved in the ugly business of politics? Well, of course, they're completely oblivious to the fact that not everyone has a benevolent male in their lives willing to look out for them. I mean, there were many, many women who had no men at all looking out for them, or the men were malevolent. And part of the reason they needed the vote was to give themselves rights independent of men who would do them harm 
whether these were ex-husbands or you know whatever the case might be. So um, you know, even within a family, as in the case of Rosalie Jones, you would have even women who disagreed on the issues. And for the suffragettes who said, look, if you don't want the right to vote, don't vote, but don't deny me the right to vote. Let me do what is best for me and my family. But their argument was, well, if you get the right to vote, if women like you get the right to vote, we will have to vote to cancel out your votes. So, you know, there was this kind of ugliness and malevolence between even women. I mean, you, you would think, of course, all women want the right to vote, but some didn't. They did not want things to change. It made them very uneasy to think that a woman like Maude Malone, you know, who cared about the working class and workers' rights, you know, and, you know, her parents just, you know, they just got here and we've been here for generations. She gets to say what happens, what, how it affects my family. I mean, they didn't want that. They didn't want that going on. So yeah, there was a, there was a large movement, not as large as the suffrage movement, but nonetheless, there was a movement there of, of women who wanted to deny other women their rights. And that to me, as a woman is especially disappointing. You know, I kind of expect that you're gonna be battling the men to get women's rights. Not all of them, of course. Lots of men care very deeply about women's rights. I'm married to one and both of my sons would, you know, would volunteer for that category. But, you know, the thought that there would be women denying other women their rights, just, I just find that so crushing, you know, it's, but you see it even today, so you know. yeah. I was just going to say the book echoes a lot of issues today, also like with Black yeah. Lives Matters and the riots, you know, that go on. So you know, like the difference between a riot and a protest. Can you talk about that a little? Like what? What? Oh, would, wow. You know, it's like been, what's happening today versus what happened then, and well, I, I think you know if you, well, I you know, that is such a subjective thing. I think that you really do need to be. I think, unfortunately, what we see a lot is if people don't like the cause, if they don't sympathize with the cause, they're going to call it a riot. And I think that's very dangerous and we need to be careful. Um, our right to free assembly and free association, our right to free speech, those are all so absolutely important. That's why they're enshrined in the Constitution. And, you know, I think that January 6th, that was a riot, that was an insurrection. To me, there's absolutely no doubt about it. There was violence, people were killed. Um, Black Lives Matter, you know, the ones that I saw, the ones we had here in Madison, those were demonstrations, those were protests. Um, you know, I, I don't have a strict definition for you about where the line is crossed, but what I would ask everyone listening right now is just to, when you're making that evaluation for yourself, first of all, make it for yourself. Um, you know, make sure you're considering different reliable sources of information, um, you know, and, and get as much information from credible sources as you can and try not to make a snap judgment just because maybe the cause is something that you are not instinctively sympathetic to because maybe if you really see what's going on maybe maybe it would inspire some more empathy from you but um you know that's that's a tough question it's a very fraught question but um you know i think it's 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 very subjective you think we ever learn from the past i think sometimes we do but i you know what more and more i'm seeing that um, in some cases, we are learning from the past. In other cases, it seems, you know, and this is kind of a, I don't want to be cynical, but in some cases, it seems like, you know, those of us who study history, those of us who follow history are kind of watching in horror and are crying out as loud as we can, trying to get other people to pay attention and say, we've been through this before. We really need to look at what happened in the past and what can we learn from it. So I think sometimes we do learn valuable lessons from history, but that's if we're paying attention and that's if we are willing to learn and that's if we're willing to admit wrongdoing. You know, if you, 
if your identity is just wholly solidified in the idea that you are already perfect and your country is and always has been perfect, then you are going to be very resistant to change and learning and growth. But if you can have, have humility and acknowledge that, you know, I am not perfect. I have a lot of learning and growth yet to come in my life. My nation is not perfect in there and we have the power to be better and we can be better if we dedicate ourselves to that. And if we're willing to admit wrongdoing and if we're willing to admit faults and mistakes, um, then that, you know, then I think history will benefit us. Um, and, but I also think we can take a lot of hope from history because it's not all, you know, there's so many ways in which we are better off in 2022 than we were in 1913. I mean, women have the right to vote. Um, now it's now, since we can learn from history, how important that is and how valuable it is. Now that ought to inspire us, I hope, to make sure that those rights are not denied other people. There are a lot of state measures going on, you know, in under consideration or that have recently passed that are denying people the right to vote or making it so difficult for them to vote that they might as well not have the vote at all. And, you know, and it's, it's being very targeted towards particular groups. And, you know, I think that if we learn from history that voting rights are precious, then I think maybe we'll be more inclined to make sure that everyone who is eligible to vote gets to vote and we don't make them, you know, go through all kinds of hoops and gymnastics in order to get to get their vote counted. Um, you know, to me, I hope that, that, that I hope that the book, the, uh, the Women's March inspires people to not take their own vote for granted. And one other thing about these three narrators and about all these women working in the suffrage movement, they did not all belong to the same political party. Um, they, and I talk, talk about this on the vote when it came up to the, for the time of the election. You know, they all, each, all three of my narrators, each one of them supported a different candidate that they would have voted for if they had been allowed to, which, you know, they weren't. But um, it wasn't one party's movement. It, when, you know, of course, we had more active political party. I mean, you don't hear anybody, you know, rallying to the cause of the Bull Moose Party much anymore, but they were, you know, pretty important at the time. So um, I think it, it's important to note that these women wanted the vote for all women on principle because it was a matter of principle for them that women get the right to vote, even if they didn't like the way that woman over there or that woman over there was going to vote. They wanted women to have the right to vote, even if it meant that their guy might not get elected. And I think that is something that unfortunately you don't see much of in our very heated political climate right now. There are measures that are trying to keep the other side from voting rather than focusing on the principle of democracy that you know everyone should have a voice you know every adult you know we don't want five-year-olds voting or you know barney the dinosaur would be president but you know i digress so the, the principle was more important than a particular political platform and um you know that i thought was very significant a very significant feature of that march that um you know, I hope isn't lost on readers. I hope they see that whatever your political party is or no political party, I hope that we can all agree that democracy is fragile. It needs all of us to be allowed to participate. And even if it means you're gonna lose this election or somebody's gonna lose that election, you should never be on the side of silencing someone else just because they disagree with you. I agree. So, you know, in, in the March was in 1913 and suffrage was approved in 1920. So it took all those seven years for suffrage to, to be approved. So the march has really worked. I mean, the movement was great. I mean, people should keep doing this today that all these things really uh, work. Right, and those rights should be pr protected. Peaceful public demonstrations 
and I emphasize peaceful, you know, they, they should be protected and the right should be protected. People shouldn't feel afraid to go out and speak their minds. And that was one of the things that, you know, Alice Paul ran into, you know, she planned this out and with her committee, they planned this out. They got all the permits. Sometimes they had to fight and argue um, to get their permits and they tried to do everything right. And one of the things that Alice Paul did was she tried so hard to make sure there would be adequate security on the day of the march. She repeatedly advocated for uh, for the women who were going to be participating and the men that were going to be participating to make sure that they would be protected, they would be offered the same protection that the men were offered uh, when they demonstrated, when they had their marches. And it was such a struggle. And, you know, they all, they tried to call in, you know, because a lot of these women were connected to men of influence. So they tried to talk to, you know, this cabinet member and that important general to try to get protection from all these different angles. And that was denied them, you know, that Superintendent Sylvester spent a lot of time, you know, saying, oh, yeah, yeah, you, you'll be safe enough, you know, but what they were really hoping was that, well, the women would feel, they would feel too nervous. And so they'd just call off the march. Alice Paul could have told them that that was never going to happen, whether it was dangerous or whether it was protected, they were going to march. They should have been protected. There was enough advance notice. There was plenty of time, you know, to bring in more security. They did it for men's marches. All the certain, you know, protocols that were followed, they should have done it for the suffragettes. And it, you know, it, it, they fell far short. But in the end, although the march didn't unfold as Alice Paul hoped, that very negligence brought more sympathy to to the movement and made people who might've been ambivalent before respect a lot of these suffragists who were out there, you know, bravely and with great dignity, enduring the suffering at the hands of people who seemed just vicious and brutal. And I mean, we saw the same thing in the civil rights movement, um, you know, decades later that, you know, the, the, the dignity of say, for example, John Lewis, you know, practicing nonviolence, it, a lot of whites who, you know, Northern, Northern whites and whites elsewhere who, you know, just thought, ah, that's not really our issue. Um, when they saw, you know, the juxtaposition between the terrible treatment that was being inflicted upon the civil rights marchers and the strength and courage and prayerful dignity that they demonstrated in response, that changed a lot of minds. So, um, you know, I, th I think we do see, and you alluded to this, I think we do see similar features in marches and in demonstrations um, throughout our American history. And, um, you know, it's, but I do think that we need to make sure that those rights are protected. So we're going to get to the Q&A in a few minutes. I just have one more question, but uh, somebody, a uh, Leslie Popkin just wrote into the chat. When are you going to be the next president? <laughs> when am I going to be the next president? <laughs> Why would you wish that upon me? Oh my heavens. Oh my goodness. I would have to wear a suit. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get to live in Wisconsin anymore. No, I just, I don't think I, I could, first of all, let me just tell you, I could never get elected. I could never get elected. Oh my goodness. I just couldn't do it. I don't even, I didn't even like selling Girl Scout cookies when I was a kid. There's no way I'm going to be asking people for, you know, millions <laughs> of dollars or thousands of, I could not do it. Um, I will, I prefer to support candidates, um, not necessarily who share every single view that I hold, but whom I trust to have good character and intelligence and compassion, um, you know, I, I'm not gonna agree with anybody on every single issue, but someone I trust to know the issues and vote with good conscience. And, uh, you know, that that's where I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be supporting like, like I love one of my senators, Tammy Baldwin, I'll just tell you. Um, you know, I'm sure, you know, I've met her. She's an absolutely lovely woman. Um, fantastic senator for the state of Wisconsin. But I bet if we had a long enough conversation, we would find points where we don't 100% agree. You know, um, I'm sure we would. 
but I trust your judgment and I trust your character to make good decisions for the people of Washington while she is in, while, while she's in office. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be someone who is a mirror in, image of me, but oh my gosh, it's so much better that she is doing that job and not me. Just, <laughs> yeah, we'll just, because then when would I write? You know, when would I write? So, so what are you writing people? next? What are you writing? What next? am I writing next? Well, I'm glad you asked because there it is. Well, see, I'm on a mirror. There you go. See, here it is. I, I'm so glad you asked that question. It's a very important question. My next book is Switchboard Soldiers. It's more historical novel. It's, it's more historical fiction. And it's coming out on July 19th. And I actually discovered this subject while I was writing or while I was researching and writing um, the Women's March. Because, you know, if you've read the book, you know Woodrow Wilson is not exactly the hero of this tale. He was just, you know, and, and if you've read history, you know, he was not really such a great guy. Um, but he was adamantly against women having the right to vote. He didn't even particularly like women. Um, he liked a very, a very particular type of woman, subservient and, you know, not challenging him too much. Um, but he even said that women who spoke in public gave him a chilled feeling. Oh, just, just found them very awful. But then I was, as I was doing my research, I realized, I discovered that he was so impressed with the way that American women conducted themselves during the Great War, during World War I, that before the war was even over, he had completely changed his mind. And he decided he he completely changed his look out, uh, his outlook, and he decided that um, women deserve the right to vote because of the way they have conducted themselves on the home front and even over there. And I was like, wait, 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 that guy, Woodrow Wilson, all of a sudden is in Congress advocating for women to get the right to vote. I mean, that guy. So I thought, okay, well, what was it that changed his mind? These women must have been absolutely amazing. What did they do? And I, I guess, well, of course, nurses, you know, sure, there were, there must have been nurses um, over there. But then I thought, okay, I got to look into this. And then as through the course of my research, I found that there were women who were involved in, I mean, and most of them couldn't vote depending upon what state they were from. But women just absolutely jumped in. Now, we know a lot about Rosie the Riveter. We hear a lot about that. Um, but, you know, what were women doing during, doing during World War I was an, an area of history that I was not very familiar with. So in the course of my research, when I discovered all these different things that women were doing, I discovered that one of the most crucial jobs women performed over there was telephone operator. Because, you know, this was, radio had been invented, but it, the golden age of radio wasn't coming along until the 1920s. So, you know, we have, if you watch war movies, or if you, you're used to seeing them talking, communicating between headquarters and the front using radios. That was not an option for World War I. The way they communicated was through the telephone. And this was connecting calls was a very complicated process. You had these wires with jacks and this big board in front of you and a light would go off for the caller and you would have to talk to them and ask them where the number was. And then when they told you, you'd have to stick a jack over here and I'm doing it so leisurely and they had to do it like this, this, this and pull this one out. And oh, it was such a complicated process. And Americans had the best phone technology in the world and American women were the best telephone operators in the world. This was considered women's work because it was hard, it was tough, and you had to take abuse from irate callers, you know, customer service. And men would get into arguments with them, whereas women would, would just put up with it better, which is just, you know, it makes a 21st century woman roll her eyes and say, maybe nobody should have to put up with that kind of workplace harassment. But it was one of the reasons why it was such a, you know, most people who were telephone operators in the United States were women. So when General Parrish Pershing 
had, you know, America joined the war in 1917 and he had it over there. And he saw that in France, the telephone system was practically antique. And he knew that if he was going to help the allies win the war, he had to be able to communicate not only with his own officers out in the field, but he had to be able to communicate with other outposts, with other headquarters, and he had to be able to communicate with his allies, with the French communicate, uh, commanders, with the British co commanders. And he realized early on, the only way this was going to happen was if he had American telephone technology and if he had the best telephone operators in the world. And that meant American women. But American women were not allowed to be in the United States Army. So first, they started trying to train men who worked on telegraph lines to become telephone operators. And they just, they just couldn't do it. They wanted the same service they had back at the States. So General Pershing told the army, you need to start getting the best people for me. And that means women. So a call went out for American women who wanted to go over there and they had to be fantastic telephone operators. They had to have level heads. They had to be able to speak French fluently because often they would be translating on the fly between a French general and a British or an American general. And they had to train and they couldn't talk to each other. So the, the telephone operator had to do the translation right there on the spot and it had to be accurate. And of course, these women also had to have absolute impeccable loyalty because they'd be dealing with military intelligence and military secrets. So these women, some of them were French immigrants or Belgian immigrants. They were from Louisiana and they grew up speaking French. They were French Canadians. They were French majors in college. And all of these women were recruited and they were in the US Army Signal Corps. And they went to France and they were, some of them worked on the front lines, well, not necessarily in the trenches. And some of them worked at outposts to the rear where you know there were services of supply bases and everywhere in between. And without that communication, you know, you have to wonder how, you know, would the war have lasted even longer? Would victory have been secured? But I was astonished that I had not heard of them before. And I thought, well, if I didn't hear about it, probably a lot of other people haven't heard about it. And these women are so amazing. I wanna, I wanna share their story. So you can tell I'm a little enthusiastic about this book, maybe just a little. So That's it'll be coming out in July, on July 19th. And I, I really hope that readers will, you know, will, will pick it up and enjoy it and just, you know, learn something new about some really, really amazing women. And, you know, there were some Belgian women, there were French women, and then there were American women, all of them in the U.S. Army Signal Corps uh, telephone unit. Um, so, you know, you know, after I learned about them, I was like, yeah, I can understand why Woodrow Wilson, you know, these women and other women like them, I can see how even his, you know, very stubborn mind was able to be changed. Sounds like another interesting book. You'll have to come back after we all read it oh, and I'd talk about to. that. I'd I have love a, to. I have a few questions in the chat and sure. some comments. It says, Jennifer, your passion is oozing from your pores. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I haven't read your book yet, but I- Oh, uh, I didn't have too many spoilers. No, oh. did have a question. Is your research, did you find it, uh, find if Margaret Brown, the unsinkable Margaret, uh, Molly Brown marched in the parade or otherwise participated? Oh, you know what? My, like I said earlier, there were so many thousands of women who participated. I, my research did not focus on her, um, but uh, that would be a really interesting question if she was in the parade. I'm trying to think if I came across her name at all. And I, I don't remember if I came across her name. So I'm sorry, I don't, I can't tell you yes or no for sure. But uh, now I'm now I'm curious. So now I'll, I'll probably when we're done here, I'll probably start looking it up. <laughs> uh, Joanne Peterson wrote, I'm listening to your book on CD. Uh, Nellie Bly, the groundbreaking reporter, isn't mentioned. She was a herald on a horse in the parade. Is she in the book? Also, Margaret, the unsinkable again, Molly Brown was active in the suffrage movement for women. Did she march with Colorado? Uh, again, I'm not I'm not sure about um, Molly Brown. And um, I did focus on other women. 
Inez Mulholland, for example, who was the lawyer. I mean, it was very unusual for a woman to have a law degree. Uh, I do talk about her quite a bit because of her important role as the herald who led the parade. And um, she was chosen because she was brilliant. She was an active suffragist. Um, she had a law degree, so she certainly represented women uh, well that way. And uh, she was an excellent horsewoman. And they had her on this beautiful white horse in this uh, just stunning costume. So she was the woman who was at the very head of, of the parade, Inez Mulholland. Do you have time for a few more? Or are you running out? Sure. Yeah. Why not? Okay. So Leslie Potson said, you mentioned that the suffragists worked in different areas of the country for a common cause. We have modern technology in our favor to do the same, to gather around a common cause. What would these three narrators tell us to move the women's right movements forward and to unify from our various parts of our country? Oh, wow. Um, you know, it's one thing to say what they would do as fictional characters. It's very difficult for me to uh, say what they would do if you're referring to the actual um, actual historical women, if you're asking me what they would want to do. Um, I think they would be impressed with the progress that they've made, we, that we've made, but I think that uh, I think that you would likely find Ida B. Wells Barnett advocating very strongly for um, women of color, black indigenous women and other people of color and making sure that, you know, cause a lot of these voting measures that are restricting voting in different states are pretty clearly targeted towards these groups. I would imagine she would be still very outspoken on that issue. And, um, you know, she was, as a journalist, she was a, a magnificent advocate for, uh, for the black community and as well as being a suffragist, a suffragist. And, um, you know, in 2020, I believe, uh, maybe, maybe it's 2020, no, I think it was in 2020, um, she was posthumously awarded a Pulitzer Prize for her journalism. So her writing was so on point and, you know, just so crystal clear and strong. I think that she would, she would have a lot to say about what's going on uh, with voting issues today. And um, boy, it would be, there are a lot of people who have carried on her work and work like that. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure that's where she would be. And I think similarly, um, Maud Malone would be advocating for workers. She would be arguing for not leaving the poor behind. She would be advocating for immigrants as a child of, of an immigrant. This was something that was very close to her heart. And, um, and I think that, you know, they would probably be very pleased with the progress that have, has been made, but I think that they would also be very determined that we not consider the job finished and that we continue to try to move forward in, um, you know, really, really striving for equality for all, regardless of race, regardless of sex, regardless of, you know, your economic status or, you know, things of that all, all of those different kinds of categories. Jennifer, thanks. This was really great. I think we really need to thank all women who devoted their lives to the movement and have worked so hard to make the future generations for all of us possible. Thank you. You were wonderful. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You really brought the book to light. Oh, good. <laughs> and I hope you enjoy it. If you haven't read it yet, I hope you'll pick it up. And I hope I didn't spoil too much. It's, no, it's well, hard. We assume that most people read it. Okay. Well, I hope what I hope instead of spoilers, I hope I encourage you to to read it and learn more about these pretty amazing women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and, and someone, um, I, I just see one more comment. Lee wrote, she doesn't remember when Great Brit British women got the right to vote. It came kind of piecemeal. Um, first, it was given to women who were over 30 and owned property, and then it was given to more women. So it happened over a process of years, and it was it began during uh, World War I. And it was, you know, during that time as the war was going on, um, certain people in parliament realized that we need, after the war is over, we need to have parliament really be more representative of all of the different constituencies. And that means, you know, 
And then they did this long study about it. And then in one little paragraph, they said, suffrage should be considered extended to certain groups of women. And it was like, it was this revelation buried in like a tiny little sentence. So it was little by little, women were given, first it was women who were pretty wealthy and had, uh, you know, and had property or were married to men who had property. Then it was college graduates. And then, and then too, in some of these reforms, men who weren't allowed to vote because they didn't own property, they were also given the right to vote. So, you know, they had certain restrictions of Great Britain that we didn't have here where it was limited to property owners. But, you know, British Parliament said, we're gonna have all these men who were over there risking their lives for our country. We're gonna have them come back and tell them, oh, no, no, you can't vote. Well, obviously they had a, they had a problem. They had a moral and ethical issue with that. So in extending it to some women, they also extended it to a great many men who didn't have it. Have it. So it was like in the, you know, um, like around 1918 and then going on with new measures every so often until it was extended to many more. So I just saw that, Lee. I hope that, hope that answered your question. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Appreciate it and enjoyed the book. And the reason I know that, Lee, is because the book I'm working on now is set in England during World War I. So it's okay. not like I'm a super genius <laughs> with all of these facts at my fingertips. It's because I'm actually writing about it. So I should have just let you think I was a super genius. Well, we do. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was really appreciated, Jennifer. Oh, sure. Thank you very much. I'm gonna end. I'm gonna end. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming. Bye. Thanks, Thank everyone. Bye. Bye.